Welcome to the Blade Fit Today podcast, where we discuss the lively world of historical fencing and everything related to the sword arts around the world. This episode will be an in-depth look at our guests' background and accomplishments, the sword club life, as well as their current experience in training, their goals, and what they are doing to get there. Derek Shorey, a true renaissance person at just 28 years old, our guest has already achieved a remarkable level of proficiency in a wide range of disciplines. In the realm of historical European martial arts, our guest has been honoring their skills for nearly two years with a current focus towards the Polish saber. As a left-handed practitioner, they bring a unique perspective to the art. Our guest is also a multiple state champion in choir, having, vo having wowed audiences with their vocal talents and musical sensitivity. Thank you. When they're not swinging a sword or belting out tunes, they can often be found immersing themselves in the world of Dungeons and Dragons or composing their own music. With such a diverse range of interests and accomplishments, it is no wonder that our guest is so passionate about historical European martial arts. We can't wait to hear Derek's insight and experience on these topics. Derek, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Nate. I really appreciate being here. Um, you know, now that I hear you read out the thing that I wrote for you, it feels a little a little more pompous and pretentious <laughs> than I originally anticipated. I got you, buddy. I got you. And there's more where that came from. <laughs> okay, our next guest, Eric Kukta. Eric's natural curiosity has led to a life of, ob of observing and learning, earning him the title of world's shallowest encyclopedia amongst his friends. Having Accurate. Completed their education with a degree in physics, Eric has embarked on a professional career as an engineer where their, their analytical skills and sharp intellect have earned them praise from their colleagues. Their academic pursuits have been matched by their prowess in the art of swordsmanship, with the longsword being their weapon of choice. Although they have been fencing for only two years, their passion for the sport has taken them on a rising trajectory of skill and finesse. Currently, Eric is preparing to enter the Combat Con Open Steel Longsword Tournament this summer. This will be their first public tournament and are currently undergoing a training regime to develop their technique and power for it. Regardless of how they place, Eric is excited to see and learn from the many different fighters who will be attending. Eric... Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, very good. And uh, I am your host, Nathan McBride. So, uh, viewers, welcome. Thank you for tuning in with us. We're going to have a lot of fun today. So, uh, firstly, guys, first question. Why sword fighting and what do you intend to achieve with it? Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first, Eric? Go, you, can, you can go ahead and go first, Eric. Okay. Well, so the the conception of me starting my HEMA journey was playing, honestly, a silly enough, playing Dungeons and Dragons, being very nerdy. And uh, I think in second edition D&D, &D, it's called Advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition. Came out in 89. Um, the longsword is a one-handed weapon. Um, and all like all the pictures that show it in the old, like, photos they have in the books and all the supplements it is a massive one-handed weapon and uh so i like i wanted to learn a little bit more about sword fighting because when i had researched it online everybody was using it with two hands so that it was really just kind of a silly natural curiosity i looked up the closest hema club towards me and it, you were like what bladefoot academy was like two miles away from me at the time nice. and then from there it was like a just like a cascading effect like a rabbit hole <laughs> as for myself i was uh let's say corrupted in middle school when my best friend uh showed me his olympic fencing gear he'd been doing it for a while at that wait middle school sorry freshman year of high school uh my best friend had been doing olympic fencing for a little while at that point uh he showed me his gear and i wanted to get into it uh, unfortunately, his instructor moved before I could join the class. So the seed oh, was planted, but would just kind of stay in the back of my head uh, forever. 
because it wouldn't be until I was in the latter half of my college education that I would actually pick up a sword again. Uh, I had been trying to keep an eye out for fencing clubs at the time, uh, but unfortunately my college's team had just disbanded the year before I showed up. <laughs> have, have you ever, sorry to interrupt, have yeah. you ever done Olympic fencing? No, I have not. Neither have I. But anyway, I was, I was determined to hold a sword of some kind in my hands, and even though the college team had disbanded, I noticed that there was another group in the area practicing, a uh, historic European martial arts group in the area practicing. And so I j- joined them for the remainder of my time in college. After that, I came down here and joined you guys, and it's been a great experience since then. Where was yeah. that? Uh, sorry, sorry, Nate. No, <laughs> that no, was go ahead. Go that ahead. was up in Ellensburg. So oh, that's right, Ellensburg. Middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else to do but swing swords. Correct. Yeah, it's kind of nice when Hema's the only game in town. It's like everyone wants to do it. Well, you say that. We were a club of four people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good enough. Did you get to spar at all with them, or was it all just drills and practices? We did not have the safety equipment required for sparring. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we focused on was replicating the plays shown in the various manuscripts. Right. And Would- trying, to, trying to connect that interpretation between here's what the text says, here's what the pictures show. There's a disconnect here. Let's work through this and try to figure out what you should be doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, for me, my sword journey is, it, it was a long time coming. Um, I was a little kid when the original Star Wars was big. And I just thought that Luke Skywalker was the coolest hero ever. And uh, yeah, I'm that guy. And uh, it's just, the whole lightsaber thing was just brilliant. I, you know, every movie that had swords in it that my parents would let me watch was in the pantheon of my favorites. But, uh, and, you know, I do backyard sort of stick fighting with friends and stuff. Uh, nothing like actual HEMA. Just, uh, you know, you, 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 you bang sticks together. And if someone oh, leaves an opening, you kind of la- lightly tap them kind of thing, you know, keep keeping safe. Oh, you were as much kids, more polite to your friends than I was. <laughs> yeah. As kids tend to do. Yeah, we well, take wiffle, wiffle bats and just beat each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, these were... Um, pretty heavy duty sticks like leftover they weren't even pvc pipes although we did that but we discovered actually pretty quickly that if you hit pvc pipes together hard enough they shatter <laughs> and you know mm-hmm. all the pieces just kind of go off so um we got these wood gosh what what were they it was like um it was like the 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 trim that you put on the on the floor and on the on the ceiling oh, um, siding. It, um, molding that's the phrase yeah the molding but it was it was like a really nice stout molding like my buddy his parents had just redone their house and they put in some new molding and so they had all this this extra and it was like not cheapy it was it was pretty stout and so anyway that's that's why we were pretty careful with it and like dummies you know the 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 edges would be cut like this and so they had the sharp points on Ooh. it so, <laughs> but you know, like I said, we, we were basically just clanging the sticks together. Um, gosh, this was, when was this? This was junior high. So <clears throat> fast forward to me, I had an uh, hour and a half commute one way. I was living in Southern California and I could not run across, I couldn't run across the parking lot anymore. And, and so for me, uh, committing to swords play was like a fitness journey for me. And it's always, I wanted to be my best version of myself. And I knew that on my fitness journey, I needed to have something that engaged me for the whole rest of my life. And I never counted myself as like a martial arts guy. Growing up, I was always the sports guy, played football, basketball. Um, my eyesight was too terrible to play baseball because I wore glasses, but I hid the fact that I needed glasses for my parents for a very long time. Finally caught up with me in middle school <laughs> that, uh, you know, so when I tried out for baseball, when I was a little kid, I couldn't see the ball, couldn't catch it. Yeah, it was terrible. I lasted like two days on the baseball team <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, um, anyway, I, I running was great. 
you know, I was 35 years old. I started walking. I started running. I enjoyed it. But I was like, I'm going to get bored doing this. So I got to find something. So I was cruising on Amazon. And there it was. Ah, it was like the $35. Uh, you know, everyone's got one. I probably have it on the Oh, no, it's in my Kima bag. It's not on the wall back there. But, you know, it's that $35 polypropylene bat that's shaped like a sword. Oh, I started... yes. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it was the arming sword one, you know, mm. so it's really crappy if you're if you want it for, uh, you know, sparring or any kind of technique training, but great if you just want to wave it around and get beefy. So that's kind of yeah. what I did. I was swinging this thing around and I thought, man, what can I do with this? This was when was this? This was back in like 2011. And so there wasn't really a whole lot of HEMA stuff on YouTube at the time. Um I think the clubs that knew what they were doing were just kind of brand new then. And it was a really cool it was a really cool experience because we kept like people who were doing it and putting stuff up on, on YouTube, we were finding each other. And then I realized, whoa, this is like full on martial art and there's and there 'cause I, I had gone on like this uh six year journey of just swinging swords, doing fitness routine stuff with it. So I found the point of balance, I found just all kinds of cool movement with it. And then I and then I I saw some of the, the images to the Lichtenhauer manuals and what I had figured out all on my own over like this crazy bohemian six year period, it was all there. Oh and nice. I thought, oh dude, this this just rocks. And I knew for a fact that that it that it worked because I had done it, right? I not martially, just I, I was just totally solo. But anyway, so that's that's the beginning of my sword journey. And I knew, I was like, I have to share this with people. I have to share this with people, and I have to, like, get them good so we could fight each other. <laughs> right, have <laughs> somebody to do it with. Right. I distinctly, yeah, and I distinctly remember, uh, I, so I, I used to work in Carlsbad, California. So uh, I would sneak my lunch at my desk because I, I was a CAD designer mm -hmm. um, for a, a medical device company. And um, so I would eat at my desk and do my work and I would take my lunch time outside. And it's, you know, it's Southern California. It's right on the beach. It's like San Diego County. It's gorgeous. It's where Tony Hawk lives. He lives in that town. And so on my lunch break, I would go out and do swords. And I remember the sun shining on me. I'm working up a good sweat. I'm swinging the sword. And it all hit me. I was like, you need to start a club. And just the euphoria that hit me. And, uh, yeah, so here we are. And that's that. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So you lived in, where did you say, Carlsbad Cavern? That's Southern California, right? Well, uh, Carlsbad, the town. I didn't live there. I worked there. Oh, you have right. to be a millionaire to live there. But you're you in the area, You have to be a millionaire to live in a regular house to live in Carlsbad. Right. <laughs> I, yeah, it feels like that's getting that way everywhere. You've got to be a millionaire to have a house. Yeah, anywhere with good weather. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but, that's not Ohio. Well, the trick, the trick is you buy, Ohio, by the way, the trick is that you buy property north up in Canada now. And as temperatures keep going up, we will move there and it will be a nice temperate climate. Yeah. In 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be California to Canada, what they were to Washington. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess in a, in a similar way, my, um, my HEMA journey, it was like, like the backyard warrior thing kind of started mm. where, I bought a, um, I got really into like Irish stick fighting, not like um, single stick, but um, quarter staff, like cudgel. Yeah. So then it, I was, I was living in Washougal at the time, which is for anybody who doesn't know, is kind of a ramshackle like Boone's town. And I had a little backyard and I would just like swing away at a stick at a tree all day, like a big quarter staff stick. And then eventually I graduated to finding a HEMA class which was really cool like I don't know it was um it's an eye-opening experience being able to compare yourself in real time to other people because I don't I don't think that without the competitive aspect I would try to maintain the same level of athleticism right like if I came to the class I think that's a big thing that you've really achieved Nate is like there is something to aspire to when I get to class like I saw the talent like just starting off trying to fight you and figure things out. And then especially with uh, Eric, actually, I'd be like, okay, like this is, this is what I can get to. 
and I know where I'm going. You know what I mean? Like, mm. so that was a really big thing to me. Being able to see my, um, see where I'm going. It was like a huge reason to get me to continue to do HEMA. Nice. <laughs> dead space is yeah. for podcast. That's what editing is right. for. You <laughs> yeah, edit right, the dead right. space out. You just, yeah. just de breath yeah. everything. Yeah. 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 No, I, I really like what you said. Um, something to aspire to. And like, yeah, I want that. That's where I want to go. And man, I mean, I guess because I've heard this, right? I've heard this from other martial arts. You hear these guys talk and they say the well is there's no bottom to the depth of this well like you can always <laughs> learn something more and that's that's why i like historical fencing because it's not just one thing either it's not just one sort of discipline and you know they're all related the more you get into it the more it's like well, that's all body mechanics and you know the 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 masters they uh, you know they would emphasize certain things and but they would emphasize certain things and they work in a time and place it's very important mm -hmm. to learn specifically and and um to recreate that crisply, right? So, and so I'm not not um, saying that that's not important. But what I am saying is that all those little things you just keep learning, and just just the simple like Zornhau, right? There's so much to it. Uh, I, I don't want to sound like all woo woo, but you know, you could do it to somebody sometimes, and you can you and it won't work other times. And until you can do it all the time against everybody you haven't exactly mastered it now have you no never i mean it's there are still things today that i feel like would work especially being left-handed actually that i feel like should work in most scenarios and then um i mean like uh I was practicing my like my olympic lunges and i call them olympic lunges as i basically missile guide lunge as far as I can at a person and try to <laughs> snipe their leg because um, I'm tall enough to be able to do that. It's quite rude when you decide to do that. Yeah. I'm, well, I mean, especially, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm what, six foot, six foot one. So most other opponents and I'm left-handed. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of an awkward outside, really low hanging guard if you're prepared for it. Um, and as, as clean and safe as it feels sometimes, I mean, I, you know, I guess what you're saying is very true. I just wanted to point out that, that I've been working on that and I feel very good about it. But um, that kind of leans into your second question, actually. Yeah, it's, it's kind of it's cool. We were going to bring this up because, uh, you know, Derek is a left handed fencer and uh, the manuals don't really illustrate much with left handed stuff. And a lot of the drills um, you're paired up as right hander to right hander. And so when you try and do it left-hander to right-hander, really interesting things happen. <laughs> yeah, really, uh, I would say not mostly negative, but mostly confusing is, is an accurate way to put it, in my experience at least. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, being left-handed, it's just what you are, right? So, um, and I think there's a reason why, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, left-handers are the devil because they don't know how to sword fight them classically. And uh, it's just their way to just kind of dig on left-handers. <laughs> um, but, you know, you look at left-handers in sports, and it's, there's just kind of this weird advantage that, that being left-handed has um, if you know how to exploit that, I guess. Yeah, it's definitely a different sort of game. Um Whereas squaring off with a same handed opponent, you, well, I mean, you're facing a mirror of yourself, you know what to expect. Um, as a lefty fighting a right handed person, like for single sword, for example, when we're doing um, British military saber, the, um, the natural response to cut to one side and then guard another, to me at least, kind of goes out the window. And um, this was something that was really hard for me to understand as I was learning. And it was a really frustrating barrier because Eric can attest to this for a very long time. Every time Saber came around, I was always distraught because like I just couldn't I felt I couldn't figure it out. I could not figure out Saber and I would just get my ass whooped by people all the time. Um, like newer, like new, new students, too. Um, 
And it wasn't until I kind of got the grasp of the left-handed, you know, outside game that it really started to click or really learning how to, um, in my case, making a lot of passing steps was really good for me. Um, so kind of squaring my body off to get myself more, I don't know how to say, like teed up to my opponent, to, like a boxing up or even in a grappling situation. That has all been really successful. But yeah, left sometimes being left-handed is as frustrating for me as it is for the person who I'm fighting. Yeah, and I can see why you like Polish Saber so much because um, with British military Saber, it's it's very in line. And, um, you know, doing doing that, uh, that uh, you know, that... We, okay, so your lead foot is your left, right? So for people who, who are just listening. So your lead foot is your left, and uh, for you to... Tr it's, it's not exactly a traverse, but it's in effect a, 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 a traverse because when you're doing a passing step with your right foot to close, now you're moving into their inside... And that kind of gives you advantage because your sword is are to your outside, but it's to their inside. Right, yeah. And it's it's crossed a line across my body in a way that feels I've I'm more so protecting my inside, which is it's is odd to think about, right? Because I'm I'm almost flat squared up with my opponent. Whereas um and again Eric exploits this quite well because we we fight together a lot and he's right handed. Um I would have this issue where I would throw cut one for me a cut one so a cut um, starting from upper left descending down across my body to the right and he would catch my cut he would cut into it and then very very easily redirect because he's already on my inside line and then simply strike me for free to the head because mm -hmm. he had blocked me out um, and that was an odd thing that for whatever reason I just couldn't seem to get around for a little while. Well, and I think the thing there, Derek, is when you throw a cut from left to right as a lefty into a righty, you're cutting into my outside guard, which is sort of the default position for a lot of right-handed people, I think. Yeah, to begin with, too. And it's a really strong position to be on the inside of that bind, mm -hmm. especially against a left-handed person, um, which would started me into um my my analogy of the best defense against your opponent is to point the gun at your opponent so okay. holding my hand <laughs> i would hold my sword hand high um and if i was going to make a cut one it was going to be the like i they were going to have no choice but to either step back or block it was going to be the hardest cut one i could throw you're taking wrath guard with a saber is what you're doing pretty much yeah <laughs> everything goes back to longsword in the end yep so um but yeah i found a lot of success in that um so far cutting from a uh like a cut six right C cutting across from my inside to my outside um, into a deep lunge to a leg has has been pretty successful. Um, just small little things like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, well, it's it's actually a cut five, but it's your cut six. So um, for a right hander, you're cutting to their inside, right? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, right, and so at least with the British military saber, they say not to do that move because it it leaves your head totally open but for you you get to be able to do that and so it's it's hard it's it's hard to to um do that guard if you're guarding your leg from the inside because it's it's not what you're used to uh training for because you don't expect like a, a kamikaze move like that but what makes it so amazing is is it's not a kamikaze move for you <laughs> No, and it's not a kamikaze move for the righty either. Like, because uh, a because a hanging guard or a um, a shift doesn't it doesn't make sense. It would be, I mean, what? So shift is. I'm trying to think here. Yeah, like it's just pulling something the out outside. of the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So out of the way. So if you shift it, you would it would be a weak shift, and you'd be so low to the ground. A hanging guard, you would be attempting to do a, you know protect your outside with a hanging guard. Um, mm -hmm. against a leg shot. Well, and you're supposed so. to defend the leg by slipping the leg out of the way anyway, which I think raises an interesting fact when you have a lefty striking at you like that, and if they tend to get close as you do, Derek, 
even if I shift my lead leg out of the way, you have hit my back leg on at least several occasions because you got yeah. so close that yeah, I could well, shift my front to. out. So, yeah, I mean, like in my experience as a lefty, there's a lot more distance to cover um, in a fight, especially with uh, like one handed weapons. Well, I shouldn't say that in in British military style. So having my like uh, both of our lead foots are we're towed up with each other rather mm -hmm. than them yeah, being like a mirror image. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there sometimes distance is really small. Like it's normally the way that fights go for me at this point are my I get wrist sniped the outside of my wrist or my forearm, the top of my forearm, which I'm sure that, you know, righties experience all the time in, in you, regular fencing but yep. mm, not it, not against right on right i don't it's it's timed shots to my to my lead arm are particular against lefties left on right yeah, yeah. and that's that again that's like that if they throw a weak cut one at you um and you have good spacing or i mean yeah if you just wait it out um watching as it just kind of drifts by your body it opens you up because if you swing on a lefty or if i swing on a righty and i completely whiff it i've now just completely opened up my my outside um so the game becomes kind of traversing me to the left and them to the right to try to get to the outside of somebody because the inside is so safe in those fights one-handed that's interesting all right, so uh, Eric, how do you thwart the left-handed fighter? Mm -hmm. Oh, what are some, yeah, well, what are some tricks you've learned? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could tell you what he's learned better than that because I've experienced it so much. Uh, so, what I'd say in particular against lefties, uh, due to due to the timed shot on your sword arm being such a threat, is first intention actions are very rarely the correct approach for a right-on-left fight for either fighter, in my opinion. Uh, if you do not have impeccable uh, guard coming out of your first cut, you are going to get sniped in the arm. Uh, so I find fainting your way in is a lot easier, and at that point, if they react to your faint, you're cutting their sword arm for what they were trying to do to you. Uh, I'm less a fan of leg shots than Derek is. I don't experiment with them quite as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you shouldn't in in uh, classic Hema. They're hard to pull thing. off. They are, and I just I haven't put the practice in to try to actually use them in a competitive context. They're very gamey. I mean, like if I was fighting in real life, I wouldn't. I would never attempt a shot to the leg. Me um, <laughs> it's quite. I've been watching a little, a bit of like Olympic fencing and stuff lately, and watching their footwork has been really fanciful. So it's kind of been things that, you know, just trying to expand my horizon. Um, so yeah, don't try leg shots. Typically, they're terrible. Mm. I noticed uh, in our last class you were bouncing around pretty good uh, on your feet, and not to change the subject, but um, yeah. So that's that's kind of like Olympic fencing thing. Like I thought, ooh, Olympic fencing, because you were kind of. Like hopping, 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 and then poof, really getting in there. Well, and it's not to say there's no overlap between the two. As you said earlier, British saber fencing is on a line, so there's a lot of overlap in the footwork between it and Olympic fencing. Yeah, it's the grandpappy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say like British, like uh, Napoleonic era fencing, right? So it's not just the British, right? It's like French, Italian, British. Sure. And then there's like Hutton came around, and those those people like later the Italian – uh, saberists and in, in the French really kind of refined it to like uh, gymnasium saber, and then that's the you know the direct parent, and then boom, Olympic saber. So the the footwork is all the basic footwork is exactly the same. For sure, in yeah. my opinion. Hmm. I don't. I mean, I don't know enough about. I mean, I would trust you when you say that. I don't know a lot about. Um... British Sabre. I guess I don't really know a lot about Olympic either, but I, the only difference I put between <laughs> to make it more HEMA friendly is I would um, with my 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 missile guided lunges is um, I would balestro to try to throw off the timing and then yeah. 
as I as I went for the um, the lunge, I would really just throw up a hail mary like like Saint George as I'm falling, um, and it, and most of the time people it would just glance right off or you would be like Eric would and I would I he would anticipate my balestro and then just snipe my ankle on <laughs> just completely free and then I'd have to stop and I'd look like an idiot cuz now I'm just hopping around on one foot and I'm like man nice reset <laughs> so for me um um I, at first I had a really difficult time fencing left-handers, especially with one-handed swords, without a shield, it just drove me absolutely nuts. And to be honest with you, it's still just a weird challenge. I mean, it is. Was, um, was there a particular, sorry to interrupt, was there a particular vulnerability or pr- particular aspect about fighting them that was giving you trouble, or? Well, at the time, all I could figure out was, hey, none of my tricks are working. Like, ah. they're, they're able to, they're able to, um, yeah, the, like all my attacks, they could they could parry them pretty easy, and not like a right-handed um, fencers. They just they 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 seem to not be able to right um, because cutting the same way mm, cutting the angles in, were just all wrong. Yeah, yeah, cutting into a righty's inside is cutting into a lefty's outside, and so mm-hmm. the the weaknesses of each position swap. Yeah, but um, we're very fortunate. Um, in our club, though, uh, because we've had several left-handers come in, and um, it's it's been actually pretty cool. Um, yeah, so we've since then I've gotten more practice <laughs> against left-handers, um, but also training with left-handers is is quite interesting. Um, but anyway, so a couple things that that uh, that I've learned is um, so Derek, what, what you were talking about, you you like the passing step in fighting yeah. right-handers. I've kind of discovered the same thing um, fighting against a left-hander is um, just switching your feet and just leading with, with the offhand foot. Um, that kind of messes up the timing a little bit, um, and it changes the angles. And so you can, you, you're can giving up length, right? You can't lunge out as far, or you can as far. It's just not as quick um, because you have to go from – because you're, if your left foot is forward as a right-handed fencer – then necessarily your left uh, shoulder is out. And so like your right shoulder is behind your body. So not only do you have to step, you have to like come out here. Um, so, so you have to time it. The timing is a little bit different, but the angles are right now. Um, another thing is traversing, traversing to the outside. Um, I find traversing to the outside when you attack works really well against a left-handed fighter because especially if you get your hand up and over, their outside guard uh, while you traverse. So like you cut into the outside while you traverse and then just follow it in down over their, over their hand. And you have a clean thrust at that point. Yeah. yeah I, I found success doing that. So are you performing a passing step as you do that cut into their outside or are you trying to make it a true traverse? Uh, it's, it's a traverse in that, in that case. Um, so I, I am leading with my, you know, right, right hand, I'm leading with my right foot and then I'm traversing my, my back foot mm. off to the side and then I lunge forward. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So, but it's like a true time kind of thing. You just, you just do it. It's not one. You have to threaten with the sword first, but as you're threatening, you're stepping back and then forward. It's uh yeah, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That my first worry about that would be um, if if it's anticipated, like if you're both not fighting for the outside, and the opponent decides that they're going to take the inside, um, <clears throat> I feel like it goes from being a a clever over the top of the hand to what I described with cutting lazily from cut one and then being stuck on that outside bind. Um, that's actually what what happened between you and I during our last um, like set in our sparring mm-hmm. was when um, you you were going to the outside and I knew I wasn't going to be fast enough to try to outcompete you. Um, so then that was when I made the decision to close off and then and then force the bind and run in. And that's that's when we got into the the grapple kerfuffle. Yeah. Um, so that's what I, I that's what I like to do, especially if I feel like I'm losing to the outside. 
um, I would usually try to close myself off. And that's where the passing step really comes into because if I'm, if my shield foot is forward, um, and then I am advancing inward, then I feel more comfortable that if I, if I step, if I'm stepping in with my lead foot, then there's going to be very, very little distance between me and the opponent at that point. So, you know, the, the hands come out. Yeah. Well, some people are geared for that and some people aren't. And you definitely are. <laughs> you just go, boom! It's like, oh, creek time. And yeah. off you go. <laughs> I've, I've caught I've, it. It works well, but I've caught a couple. Uh, I've caught a couple swords to the fingers, which is really bad. Or a couple. Um, yeah, more than a couple. I've, I've, caught, I've caught a few um, synthetics and pretty badly to the center palm. But. I mean, you know, you live and you learn and hopefully don't break your hand. Yeah, we're good gloves. Yeah, it's just it's just so much fun. It just makes sense. Closing is fun. Especially against an opponent. Well, I mean, with within within confines of being respectful cuz like I wouldn't close a line in and then toss someone to the ground, but I usually yeah. will try to close and then isolate their sword hand. And then hold, you know, and then maybe give them a little bop. But other than that, yeah, I really, really like it. It's probably my favorite thing about Hema. <laughs> Should just become a wrestler <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Look, they do ring in at a lot of tournaments these days. So, yeah, I'm hopeful that the uh, the stick tournament says that like some minimal grappling grappling is allowed because that's kind of my fallback um, strategy is. I'm typically bigger than my opponent and I'm stronger than my opponent. So I, if, if I'm getting sniped, I'll, I'll start bullying my way in. And then not only that, but that a lot of the times I feel like starts to throw my opponent off. Like it's a mental game. Like now I'm being, now they're getting flustered cause I'm kind of being rude. Um, I just don't want to hurt anybody, right? Like, that's the last thing I want to do is, like, slam somebody down on the back of their head, which, I mean, I wouldn't try to anyways, but that's always the scary part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because we're gentlemen fighters at our club. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I hear you. It's, it's fun to mix it up. Um, I was on offensive line uh, in high school for four years, and I really enjoyed it. And at the time, I was a small guy amongst giants. But I, I really liked it. I thought it was great. I got to scrap my whole, like every play, I got to scrap what I felt for my life, you know, every time. <laughs> yeah. And, and I liked it a lot. I, so. O line would be is is fun to play. I played a lot of nose guard, um, ah. when I, when I played football, and that was my favorite. Yeah. Position. I played nose guard and long snap mostly, but. <laughs> no wonder I'm, you like to get in close. Yeah, right. I'm feeling the difference between us here because I was a cross country kid in high school, and I like <laughs> the distance game now that we're in sword fighting. So yeah. <laughs> you got a good backpedal. I mean, it's hard to grapple you. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, footwork is the fun. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but for me, footwork is the fundamental basics to to being a good sword fighter. It all starts there. All the angles open up. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, like, I agree. I've been doing a lot of kickboxing on the side as well now. And the phrase there is power generates from the ground. So if you're making a good cut with a sword, it's generated from the ground. You need your feet in place for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I guess maybe I'm, I'm almost fixated on that as a concept. And I don't know if that comes out um, in our classes a, a lot, but... For me, it's like I just feel that that way about it. And online, I know people say it, but I just don't feel like within the sword community that it's appreciated enough. Like I hear a lot of questions, you know, when I'm cruising, uh, you know, all the social media is like, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I'm like, oh, me, me, it's full work. That makes everything work is your full work. It's where you put your feet and everything just opens up like magic. Um, yeah, I mean, I I would agree wholeheartedly. We, um, I, I say we like the royal we. I just started. We. Um, I started on a on a footwork drill that I found just randomly on YouTube somewhere, and um, 
I've been trying to do it pretty religiously. And that was another reason why I was um, hopping around so much at the, uh, the last class was because I felt more comfortable moving my feet around. Um, and is I that, realized is, that like, is that you, the one you posted? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. 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 So that's the, that's a good one. It's rough. I can maybe get through about 70% of it. So, and like working on explosiveness is really huge. Um, just trying to like realizing if you start doing footwork, how much more you can improve was a big thing. Um, because when you're like, if you make a, what is it? Like a, like a cross, um, leg sp slip, like in fencing, you have the, you, you slip, but you step you're offline. Like, you're saying, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have a, like an offline slip that goes yeah. behind the leg. Um, I mean, if you, once you're standing in one of those, you'll quickly realize whether or not your footwork or your biomechanics are up to as much par as you think that they should be. I would have to say. Yeah, um, exactly what you said. Well, I noticed, um, well, yesterday, I know, yesterday. <laughs> Last Monday class. Monday we have our class. Last class, I really noticed that your footwork was just so crisp. And it was, yeah, it, it was hard finding angles on you. I think part of it is definitely in, uh, how would you phrase it? Um, it comes from, it comes from, to a certain degree from strength, right? If you don't have the strength in your legs to mm -hmm. step sideways confidently, uh, you can't do a lot of the, the better footwork that's necessary for, call it advanced fighting. Um, right. It, and and I think I think where a lot of people might slip up is if you're just doing the traditional, uh, you know, deadlift type exercises, you're not going to get a lot of those lateral motions that you need, uh, particularly for things like an offline step, uh, because if you can't do that sideways with strength, you can't do it stably, and you're not going to be able to make a counter cut from that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the same way that like nothing will ever replace the clean and jerk. I would definitely say that nothing nothing would ever replace a like you know an offline slip or just being in a sumo squat position and moving your feet around when you're when you're comfortable in a fighting stance for long periods of time and you can like you can use that power to your advantage it makes a big difference you can kind of like you can really bullshit for lack of a better term um a lot of what's coming from your sword hand if as long as you understand where your leg work is because your legs are going to keep you alive more so than anything else yeah yeah mm. no I, I yeah i i agree um and i'm just learning that i've only been doing leg drills for two weeks um and so like i still have a lot to learn so I'm very excited at hopeful like you know how much more you're going to improve it is kind of dramatic, isn't it? It's huge, I would say. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on board with that, totally. All right. Um, any more tips about fighting left-handed or fighting against left-handers? Um, yeah, so... Uh, I, sorry, yeah, no, I, do have, I do have one kind of crucial thing that we glanced off of. Uh, grappling with a left-hander is very different from grappling with a right-handed person, uh, especially when you both have a sword in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing we've come to realize is that a lot of the manuscripts, when they talk about how to grapple somebody, are assuming a right on right, but with the left on left, there's a longer distance to cover before you can grab the other person because your offhand is back further, with, uh, assuming you know traditional British military saber where you're fighting in line with your offhand behind you. Um, so as Derek's learning to his detriment, perhaps, you need a much stronger bind and quicker feet if you are going to move in to grapple right on left true um which is another reason why the um <clears throat> the offline step or the passing step comes into play mm. um not only that but if like in the same vein that the um being caught on the outside of that cut one can leave you really open from a lefty fighting a right-handed or the reverse perspective. Um, if you attempt to close the grapple line with your offhand 
and your opponent is prepared for it, you can get stuck on the inside of that very quickly, and then they can they can manipulate the area. Um, the simplest left versus righty thing I can possibly think of is learn spacing, and if they're gonna throw a cut one at you, wait for them to do it. Either either wait for them to do it because you'll be able to catch them on the out on their outside um, because most times that's where they're going to end up if they whiff especially and it's almost a free shot because it's going to be really really hard for them to make a cut one and then come back into outside guard once they're done because just simply because of momentum sorry you're thinking you're thinking a righty's cut too you're thinking an uh, inside to outside cut no i'm like a like sort like a inside no outside to inside yeah a cut well for me it'd be a cut one for you guys it would be a cut one as well well it would be a cut two for me it's cut one for everybody <laughs> yeah cut. <laughs> quit, exactly. quit mirroring it just because you're left-handed doesn't mean you mirror the cuts i know i know i know i need uh, to, I, i'm the wrong one i need to follow everybody else no to me it's everybody's a cut one so, so you're saying if somebody cuts to your outside yeah so you carry right out now. keep them further out than you oh i see so it's a cut two for me so if i'm if I'm cutting at you like this, then what you're doing is you're... You no, cut kind of... one for you. Oh, okay. So like so this. So you cut. Yeah, so if somebody cuts in line at you like that, now... So if a lefty... It's hard for me to come back around to the outside and guard. Exactly. Is yeah. So that, you have that to, outside. You, it takes time. You cut, and then... you. So you're catching on the outside here, hand. right? Mm-hmm. So I've done this. I, I whiff, and then you catch me like here. And you're... Like and so. it, yeah, it's almost it's almost always free because it's very hard to come back from that position, and that happens to me too. Or, right. Yeah. Well, I, that, sorry, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, go. Okay. Um, if that happens in the other way around, so if you are noticing that either a lefty or a righty is sniping your arm that way, and you you end up whiffing or. Uh, Sorry, reverse that back. So if you whiff or if you decide to bind with your opponent and you bind and you will you will end up, if you take the initiative, you'll end up on the inside, which again, you can disengage from the opponent's weapon and go directly. You can slide up the line of their arm and hit them in the head. Again, pretty much for free. Well, and I think, so the thing is, I've, I've only just started experimenting with this, mind you, but I think the, the cure to that is to just not over commit to your cuts to to cut to center cut to long point effectively um because Mm -hmm. then your hand's already centered and it's just uh it's a rotation of the wrist at that point to return to outside guard if i cut into center then it's just a rotate and i'm back guarded nice and quick like yeah and i think that applies for both lefties and righties right you need to be a lot more careful about that in the left on right game but if yeah. you could catch them with the traverse, all of a sudden your hand isn't in this position; it's in this position. That's true. And yes, that's, and there you go. Right. And so you that's have... that's the beauty of that traverse. Right. Mm-hmm. And and the same vein is if you're in that traverse, you. I mean, if you make the bind in that way, you could very well start. You know, you grab them by their sword hand almost. Um, Devious. Yes, Mr. Devious. Mr. Grapple over why there. The Tanders were called the devil. <laughs> yeah, very very dirty fighting. That's all we do. Snakes in the grass. I, I have a lot of siblings, and half of them are left-handed. Dang. So I remember sitting at the table, and I had to be on the outside. You know, because what I you didn't like, just fight all those with your siblings like I did. <laughs> well, they, my parents have eight kids, so uh. there was there was no room. So I had to be on the outside, and then the lefties had to be on on my left. Right, we, me, and my mom are both left-handed. So when we okay. would go out to eat, we'd have to eat together because my in the middle, my dad. Yeah, my dad is <laughs> is right-handed, so they would sit on the other side, and so is my sister. So, yeah, so they're on the outside. Of the, they're on the corners. Mm-hmm. And every you're time, in the insides. Every time. Yep, that's how that works. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I, all. I for... was taught to keep my elbows in like a good boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sure, but you know, right. you're still rubbing elbows. Oh man! In Hema, he's talking about. He means keep his elbows in during Hema. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> no, I definitely meant at meals. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I sat, I have a left-handed sister, and I sat to her left for all meals. She sat oh, to my wow. right. So we would be elbow to elbow, except we learned to just eat in. Gotcha. Hey, that's kind of fun that, that all of us have left-handed people in our family. That's Well, I was going to say, 50% of your, fam- of your siblings are left-handed, Nate. You guys are a statistical oddity over there. Yeah. It's weird. Well, I, okay, I have five sisters. They're all redheads. Okay, keeping up the, the distribution. With then. green eyes. Mm. And uh, one, two, three of them are left-handed. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know genetics or what. Are they even human beings? Be. No. I'm just <laughs> oh. Well, they don't have souls. I know that. Uh, from what I remember, Derek, it's something like twenty percent <laughs> of the population is left-handed. Hmm. Oh, that like, many? It's well, it's like ten to twenty percent. I always forget exactly where okay. it's at, but it's down there. You know, I mean, gotcha. low within you know billions of people. That's millions of people at least. Yeah, thanks for the memories about the the uh, the dinner table arrangement. That's kind of fun, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it still haunts me to this day because every time I go out, if I go to eat with somebody, it's probably going to happen. Yeah, man, good times. All right, anything about... Uh, boy, my mind outrun my tongue. Anything else about fighting uh, righty to lefty, lefty to righty? A final thought. if If you're noticing you either get sniped or you're uncomfortable... If you're whether you're fighting right or a single sword or, or um, two handed weapon, if you're uncomfortable, just go into Wrath Guard. Just go into as I like to say, point the gun at your opponent, and that will that'll put strike the fear of God in them. Because I mean, if you come down with that, you're gonna you'll get somewhere, and it'll keep you out of the way. I was gonna say um, it's interesting you say that because I notice left handed people a lot less when we're fighting long sword or any other two-handed weapon sword and shield okay yeah i notice it heavily there um yeah but with a with a long sword for example i stop noticing that you are left-handed i mean you get you get the very occasional weird bit like cross docks ends up a little weaker sometimes but when you wouldn't expect it to be but eh. yeah it almost matters less because your shoulders are more square most of the time well, and you can throw cuts from both sides with just about equal power, usually, too. You, you're, yeah, I guess that comes from the shoulders being more square, and you're not, you're not generating the same inside-line weakness that you might get with a single-handed weapon. And you could throw a cut with your feet in, the sa- in both ranges, right? You could throw right. a, a number one cut with both feet forward, mm-hmm. I, I would depending say the on the distance. only thing noticeable about that would to be expect a, a Zverch more on your right side than your left side. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, I would cut, for me, it'd be a... a oh, your dominant cut. cut's going <laughs> to cut. I see what you're saying, yeah. Right. If I'm going to bind with my opponent, because they're going to ha- if they're going to throw a cut one, because that's going to be the most comfortable, typically. So mm. I'm going to throw a cut, my cut too. So we'll both throw cut ones, basically. And, uh, but for me, it would be more comfortable for me to Zverch to my left, um, which right. is going to end up hitting you in the right. Yes. Side. Yeah, I see so, what you're saying. Yeah. This is quite is... literally, and it goes for me too, because I'm uh, like bio, like I'm used to throwing um, like a cron guard up to my left, like almost as a reflex, because that's the only time I ever get zverged. Because that's where a righty is going to land on you. Right, because it's, it's a strong side, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. All right, anything else about that? Mm. No, I, I think, think that covers it. Cool. I'd mind if we shift gears then? Absolutely. Shifty, shifty gears. Okay, so let's get back to... La, 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 la. Oh, I went way too far. Um, okay, so single most important kit to learn this. So th- this is uh, like geared towards people who have nothing, they're interested, they want to get started, and somehow they found this podcast... Uh, it's, I'd say your first piece of a, a kit is always your helmet, but your second piece is a training partner that you trust. Mm-hmm. Either that or if you if you have some like um, local club, I mean, chances are they're going to have some sort of loaner gear to provide you so that you can fight at least minimally. 
to get you started because what you need more so than anybody else is a partner you you will improve vastly if you have somebody else that you can bounce your imperfections off of particularly for somebody who has no experience as you said nate you need you need that mirror you need to be looking at someone else's uh biomechanics as they resist against yours like after you get some experience, you can do as I do, where you just prop a stick up on a chair and you go, okay, if I cut into somebody like this and they parry me there, then I can wind like this. And I'm imagining the opponent, but you can't really do that when you're new. You need that other person when you're first starting out. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I agree with you guys. I'm a little bit of an odd duck, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say a good pair of shoes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I see so many people fencing barefoot. Uh, <sighs> terrible it's terrifying is what you mean to say heathens because yeah. um you do need like ultimately you do need good partners right i mean it's a martial art you need to practice with other people this is so very true for me though just looking back on my experience i didn't have any sparring partners for like i said before like six years sure mm -hmm. and just going through all the mechanics and you know i've tried plastic swords of all various types i've had wooden dowels i've done broomsticks i've done all kinds of stuff so the, i think we all agree it's not the sword that's the kit that you want although that's what everyone wants right they see the shiny yeah. sword and they all want to go out and buy it and i'm not saying that's the wrong decision but i'm but what I'm saying is, is if you really want to get into this and look at it from like a more cerebral perspective to get you set up to, to have a good experience and do it for longer, um, it's, um, yeah, a helmet is, it's hard, a good fencing mask, it's, it's hard to say that that's the wrong choice. Mm, if you want to be doing this. I'm saying proper footwork because it, it is all about the footwork. <laughs> but again, I'm a weird odd duck. Um, so, well, I mean, I know, Derek, you've been having some troubles recently with your shoes, so I can definitely yeah. see the value in having a pair of shoes that you trust. I'm also, uh, let's say, making the assumption that you came in with a decent pair of shoes, but that's just because of my history doing various sports over the years. So I, I guess I had two or three pairs of shoes laying about that worked well enough, so I didn't think about it. Right. I mean, yeah, like for some people, the barefooted thing works, and I'm using a zero drop shoe at the moment. Which I do really like. Um, I would be interested in seeing... This is a little more advanced, obviously. But I would be interested in seeing the effects of if I um, used a, like a higher-heeled shoe. Because that's what they did in um, classical British Sabre and uh, Hussar Polo Sabre. They had the, um, the big heeled boots to help them with their um, stances. But as far as the baseline what you're looking for just to get into it i mean you um and i learned this from nate you can literally go to like a hardware store buy yourself a six dollar axe handle and you have a one-handed sword like it, it's gonna be clunky it's gonna feel like a club but i mean it's it, it it will give you what you are looking for to start off with and you know just go from there well, yeah. Go ahead. Speaking of your zero drop shoes for a moment, though, that does remind me uh, back in the first club I was in. I mean, we had a pair of historical, not actually, they were recreation, uh, but shoes like somebody might have worn in the 13th, 14th century. And from what I remember, those were pretty close to zero drop. There wasn't much padding on those. So I think it would oh. be I would think it would be interesting to see you trying to recreate some longsword techniques in your zero drop shoes. Now, granted, you have better traction than the ones that we had would have had because we oh, did not yeah. have we did not have hobnailed shoes uh, for our recreation pair. They were flat soled and pretty slippery because of it. Yeah. So I wonder if to this is kind of getting off topic, but I mean, when I say um, like there's a heel to the shoe like if you look in the manuscripts in the british saber one you will see that the man has a pretty significant heel to his shoe um well it's I the idea on it's that. the cavalry stirrup thing is it not yeah that's what yeah. i was gonna say it's because they're they're riding horses and you you need a heel to keep your whole foot from sliding in the stirrup and causing trouble uh polish saber um 
like the Polish Shaper manuscript suggests that too, to have a um, a healed boot. Well, I mean, they have a curved sword, which is indicative of um, uh, horseback riding. But still, I mean, the I think the the no drop. You could do like wrestling shoes. Um, that was going to be my next thing, especially because it was going to um, support my ankles, which I really thought would be a good idea. But it kind of starts to change because you go from battlefield nasty mud getting on and off a horse you just you need to be able to stay upright to really fine tuning yourself where like um i i mean when i was fencing the other day i stayed mostly on the balls of my foot which is a very um olympic stance to take yeah it's very modern yeah so and that's just due to because we have the grace of being able to do that but i mean would i do that if i was in a field somewhere Probably not. I would be a lot more reserved. Having fought in a very gentle field, I can tell you, you do end up on your heels a lot more. Talking about yeah. last year at the Highland Games. Yeah. You, the you, grass people. is a very different traction than the gym floor, for certain. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because, um, I, well, I have a bunch of thoughts on this. And, and I think, um, Eric, you hit the nail on the head. It is about that, right? Because... With Olympic fencing, it's indoors. It's it's a it's a very manicured floor. It, you know, it's basically the same every time. Um, the footwork, I, I'm sorry, it's a totally flat. Um, your 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 shoes have to be a certain type, and it's going to give you that performance. And so you can be on the balls of your feet, like you know, super athletic, like. But you know, anytime you're on just a gentle sloping hill that has grass or or even just know, wet mud, mud or anything like that. You got to be on your heels, um, and also, you generate more power from your heels. Mm. Yeah, I'm they, not... um, I was reading stuff um, like when you're when you're punching a, a punching bag, when you rotate off your heel versus your instep, it's like twenty percent more power. It's really interesting how that works. So when you're so if you're lunging in a straight line, well, I take that to mean when you're lunging. On your straight line and, and you're off your back foot, off your heel, that's going to generate more power because the um, because it's your it's your your heel bone basically is you're balanced on that and you're pushing off of that versus your your springy foot. I'd be right? curious to see the thing you were I'll reading see. that showed you that showed you that because yeah. uh, like I mentioned earlier, I do kickboxing and we do everything is off the ball of your foot. Yes. Um, the, uh, difference, you know the, the, the difference, the difference though. So, so the one time the difference comes up though is in your front kick. If you strike with the ball of your foot, it's a push kick. But if you strike with your heel, it's a it's a penetrating kick. It's a damaging kick. Gotcha. So I'll, it's I'll it's interesting to think, to think of that. It's interesting to think of that in reverse, planting your heel instead of planting your. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it has to do with the stance that you take. Mm -hmm. Um. As opposed to, because if you're fighting with, like in kickboxing or regular boxing, right, um, <clears throat> the generation force, you're generating force from your hips. Which um, you should be doing with a sword as well if you're cutting through a target. You right. But so if you think about the way that you're going to be standing, your stance within boxing um, is going to be more squared up and upright. Where if you're in classical British military style, you're going to have your, you know, your front foot straight. And then your back foot at a what like a forty five degree angle of mm -hmm. somewhere in that area. Ah, uh, you go. So, sorry, go ahead. Well, so and I mean, I like for personal um, experience when you when you make that lunge, um, your your foot your back foot will be turned out a little bit more than forty five. And um, that that hip turn while also allowing that leg to lock and extend is what is starting to generate more power because it's it's your your body's natural kind of structure and def and and biomechanic decompressing and pushing out rather than like what Nate said is the springiness of the foot. Um, I wish I had like a you know, a, a foot whiteboard camera. Yeah. Or something. Grass. We're not, yeah. you're not launching your foot cam today. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> foot so cam. it, it makes, it makes sense in the context of 
British military saber when you're lunging from launching off of your you're you're launching off of your whole foot, but the a lot of the power generation is coming from that heel. heel. Yeah, because you're you're throwing your body forward. Hmm. Um which and is also when you connect, just to cut you off, when you connect your heel is still on the ground and your foot so you're launching your sword and your your front foot lands at the same time that your sword makes contact and so that's not where the power the power is not on your front foot the power is on your back heel as you're striking and if you do it right you could really maintain that power and cut through it it's, it's yeah. a it's an interesting feeling when you get to it so i'm sorry keep going keep going no i mean that was that's basically it because if you if you think about lunging in a saber stance um your foot is not your back foot is not going to be facing your opponent that your toes are not going to be facing your opponent if they are there's a huge problem that you're having and you should probably stop that immediately well, for your own personal the health. other way though like like say these are my say these are my heels and these are my toes you could be like this some people do fence like that and that's with the foot turned sound. turned beyond yeah. 90 pointed backwards almost yeah i envy those people's flexibility <laughs> it's not my favorite, but it, it can be done. It would be a, um, I mean, I can see where that would happen in that certain sort of sense, but um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, I well, short order, I agree. <laughs> yeah, sorry, me and my big mouth. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's um, uh, when I when I read that, I'll have to dig it up, Eric, and show you. I, yeah, I, yeah, I'd be I'd be very curious to. Because with kickboxing, I could see, especially if you're launching well, your, you're your thinking attack, you're thinking right? roundhouse kick, though. I'm talking even for a for a straight kick, for a teep, or just a, a heel kick to the stomach. That's off the ball of my foot. Right. Are you, it, are you talking about the striking foot or the planted foot? Yes. For the planted ball. foot is off the ball. <laughs> well, that makes sense because you because you've got your balance there, right? Because there's so much happening. Because it's not just. Anyway, not to get uh, yeah, little, little like, side I can see but... why they would say to do that because you gotta like when you're kicking against something, you gotta balance yourself. To... As opposed to lunging when you're on one foot and right, also need to balance yourself. But when you're coming yeah. up <laughs> on a on a punch, let's say you're doing, um, let's say you're doing an uppercut. Mm -hmm. So I think if memory serves, they're saying plant on your heel. For the uppercut, you you generate more power. Well, your 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 feet, it's a different. You're making more of a tripod, and both feet are down, and and you're and you're coming up. And so, when you when you step in, it's like you're stepping forward into the side, and then you're planting that that uppercut. You're getting more power if you plant your heel versus your versus your instep. I'll have so, to experiment with that, yeah, and see how it goes. Yeah, Dude. that's. Yeah, you'd be losing distance too, and but it's an uppercut in fencing. So if you oh, if you think about yes. a fencing stance, yeah, if you think about fencing stance and you make the lunge, your your rear foot is not facing forward for the most part. I mean, depending on your flexibility, it might have like a, it'd be past like a a ninety degree ninety degree angle, forty five degree angle from your body on either side, um, but because of the way that the extension's going it would it would naturally make sense for your rear foot to drag itself to the outside does that make sense so your foot would turn out because you're you're moving away from that foot so your toes are going to end up turning out and dragging so your heel is going to end up on the inside of your body um i'm not sure i'm quite seeing what you're saying so you're saying if i had my lead foot here and my back foot here, you're saying as I lunge, this foot would drag that way? Yeah, okay, so put your fingers back like that. Yeah. Okay, so your back foot is the bottom hand, right? The yeah. little finger. So as you're lunging, you're now start to point that finger down, pivot the, yeah, that down. So your foot's naturally going to go that way. It's going to point away. It's not going to go inwards. Like mm -hmm. you're not going to. rotating as, as your exactly. hips rotate. Right, this is my left is my as I'm rotating. That your foot kind of follows that. I can't say I've ever noticed a rotation like that. 
you should have a rotation in your cut. <laughs> no, with, rotate your foot as you're cutting. Your foot should be – as you cut, your foot should be turning. Well, well as it, you're lunging. You're lunging and then that little – that rotation as you're extended out, you should be cutting yeah. and that contact on your back foot should be there to give you that power. Huh. We're nice to each other so we don't do that to each other. But if you're actually going to cut somebody, that's what you should do. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I definitely have not been doing that. I have definitely, because when I lunge, I plant on the, I, I, I fight with my back foot at 45 degrees, right? I don't point it out to 90. I'm fighting here. Um, yeah. So what I do is I plant on the toe then. I push forward on the toe. So I'm rolling into it forward. Uh, Which so it is doesn't, a modern technique. Right. It doesn't pivot at all when I'm throwing, when I'm lunging. Really? Do you have, do you have an issue with like recovery at all? Well, you don't really lunge that deep. No, I do not lunge deep. Right. Hmm. Well, uh, Olympic fencers, they say when you're doing your footwork, you're on the balls of your feet all the time anyway. Sure. Because you're more nimble. You can lunge farther. You can recover faster. I mean, there's all those reasons. For all those reasons, it's a more athletic stance. Mm. But again, in the wild. It's on the know, Yeah, it's the gym floor thing again. Yeah, you're not going to lunge that. I mean, life or death, you're not going to lunge that far. No, you're not which gonna is. You're totally overcommit anyway. Right, which is why I maintain a shallow lunge, even though I'm on the ball of my foot. I'll have to yeah. experiment with the heel on a shorter lunge then. And I'll you see how that goes. You can't go as far. You can't go as far on the ball of your foot, I would argue. Oh, no, you can go a lot farther on the ball of your foot. If you have nine inch heels, you could go really far if you yeah. plant your heel. <laughs> yeah. You got more, right. nine more inches. You just have to but, practice the uh, javelin missile lunge. Because the, the yeah. thing to remember about going off the ball of your foot, Derek, is as you lean forward, your uh, – what's the best way to demonstrate this? Um, if you're on the – so if this is my heel back here and this is the ball of my foot, as I lunge forward, I can roll forward onto my toes as I'm lunging to get some extra distance. Whereas if you're on your heel, your heel's planted and you can only lunge as far as your leg can extend. And at that point, you start dragging your whole foot. Yeah, so then the idea is is that my foot is a 45-degree angle behind me rather than in front of me. So I I wouldn't – I don't face that problem because that's not where my foot is placed. I guess. Right, right. No, no. I just, meant, I just meant on your specific comment about lunging further from the heel. I disagree. I think you can right. make a further reaching lunge from the ball of your foot. See, my worry there would be that my I would my my toes would roll over and the top of my foot is now on the ground and I'm in a really bad spot. That's what I would worry about too. Although if it's your finishing blow and you're just so sure. Yeah, who cares? I can't <laughs> say I've I can't say I've ever had that issue. I mean I know I think I've seen Olympic fencers let their toes drag like that. I've had my inside ankle drag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're 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 not yeah. It's not straight over the top. You're pointed sideways, so you do come in maybe a little bit. Yeah, I, I've dragged my, like, reaching for it. All, um, I have dragged my, my back, but it's, it's kind of my whole thing. In my, so this is my inside heel, my outside heel. It just kind of goes down like this, and the whole thing just drags. And then, I, and then when I recover, I just do this. Right, you just roll it back heel. down. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Hmm. No recovery, only only javelin missile lunges. Right, and so to bring it back to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, you are going to what struggle. Comes back down. <laughs> you're going to struggle with that javelin lunge when you start fighting on grass, uh, because the other thing the dirt does is the dirt robs you of explosiveness. Right, you're not kicking off a hard surface; you're kicking off something that gives a little bit. Before you, know, you start to get your motion going, I have, um, I have obstacle course shoes that are like cross trainers that have hard rubber treads in inlaid into the sole, um, and they do have fantastic traction for like trail running. I think I'm gonna wear those and maybe. I, I'm gonna wonder how they do. Yeah, if they have if they have good lateral support, I think they'd work well. To cycle to circle back even further, Nate, you mentioned shoes being the most important piece of gear, yeah. but I don't think we've actually heard you say what type of shoes you would. Yeah, recommend. what type of shoes do you like? Because you, you can hear they, Derek's gone through like four different sets trying to figure <laughs> out what to wear here. You know, 
Uh, that's just the thing. Um, it depends on what ground you're on. That's mm. what I found. So, and and I've lit- I've like practiced everywhere. Um, you know, concrete, fake turf, a dance floor mm-hmm. outside. Um, you just have to have the the right footwear to where you're at. Now, um, so take the idea. Go, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say take the take the two common cases then. Take grass and take gym floor what would you recommend for those sorts of uh environments well um well first off let's let's talk about the the ideal right sure um in order to have the ideal modern shoe um it's got to have some cushioning and a lot of grip so like rubber um some kind of minimalist shoe i think uh does make for better form it Mm. just does um however uh the ideal shoe is for the ideal person. Mm-hmm. I myself am not the ideal person. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm considered crazy obese uh, on the BMI BMI charts, right? So I'm 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 almost six two. Uh, any amount of muscle uh, throws that thing off anyway. And I wait. Well, sure. I mean, I got muscle, but uh, I I'm not kidding myself. I'm I got a lot of spare, right? <laughs> so um, you know. I'm like 250, sometimes more, sometimes less. And so I like minimal shoes. But if I wear my minimal shoes too often, I've developed foot problems from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I weighed a buck 70 all day long, I'd be wearing those minimal shoes. But I have actually damaged my feet from wearing minimal shoes, even though I went super careful. I was like, okay, I'm going to wear them just for this little bit. And I'm going to stretch out my, my, um, you know, my ligaments and, and uh, my tendons so they could get used to it. And then I'll go back to my regular shoes. And I was really careful. And, you know, six weeks, no problem. This should be fine because I should have had this six week integration. So then I went full in on minimal shoes. My right foot, I hurt it really bad. And it was out of commission for a very long time. And it ruined everything. I didn't lunge as far for a very long time. And hmm. anyway, um, Long story short, uh, you have to know what is good shoes for you. So for me, I wear running shoes, um, trail running shoes, and I'll switch to my minimal shoes uh, sometimes. Sure. I love how my minimal shoes feel. My feet hate them. So I have to be careful with that. So I would say, you know, if you're not, if you're not a heavy person, like I feel like I'm light on my feet, but I'm a heavy person and it really punishes my legs. There's inertia that comes with that no matter what you do, sure. Right, and I'm working on that and that's my personal you know, thing. But um, minimal shoes, I think, teach the, helps your body achieve the, the proper technique. Hmm. I'm gonna make a hot take and I'm yep. gonna say for for like shotgun everybody what you should buy is high top wrestling shoes buy high top wrestling shoes they'll have enough support they they'll lace up really high so especially for beginners you have less of a risk of just blowing out your ankle um which i which i've seen happen a lot which i have done myself because i do like i also like the minimal shoe like i said i have the zero drop i have a zero drop runner shoe Um, that I use for HEMA that I really, really like. Um, But if I could go back, I would buy myself a pair of wrestling shoes. They're going to be, in most cases, except for fighting on dirt, which you're not even going to be as as aggressive in the first place anyways. So um, I would say, yeah, a nice, like like Adidas sells like a $50 wrestling shoe, black, nice rubber insole, um, and it laces up almost past your ankle. So could save your life so so you're looking mostly for lateral support but low uh low tread thickness yeah i mean like nate nate said in the past you know you're never going to be faster than somebody's sword no like no matter what so the if you think that a shoe is going to give you an edge if you have this like you know ninja tabby super small light awesome turbo shoe that you can hop around on the balls of your feet um it's not going to do you nearly as well as having like you know something that's going to hug your feet well it's going to feel comfortable it's going to support you when you need to 
And if something bad happens and you clomp your heel on the ground because you overcommitted to a lunge or, you know, somebody grappled you and you had to make a step that you didn't want to make, that's where you should be looking. Because most of the time you really need to let yourself like you got to look at yourself and go, I'm probably not going to be a professional athlete at HEMA. So buying $200 boxing shoes or HEMA shoes or whatever else is not going to make a big difference. So I mm. would buy something that's going to keep you safe. And for context, I'm just in a pair of generic gym shoes right now, which yeah. suffer a little bit on the dirt, but I'm not out in the dirt all too much. So that's not a particular concern I mean, right now. I, I yeah, used our a club pair is of indoors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a pl- we, we're lucky we have a gym to be able to go into. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Believe me, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think I think it was maybe forty bucks for mine. It's just whatever you know, walk into whatever sports store and just whatever generic gym shoe they had is what I picked up five years ago, and they still work. So yeah, I mean, again, people do it barefoot, but um, I would say if you're going to buy a shoe, buy something that's going to keep you safe. You know, I, I think that's a good choice. Wrestling shoes, I think that's a good... Basically, it's it's a, it's a lower-profile cross trainer, basically. Mm. Mm-hmm. I was kicking about the idea, actually, of uh, indoor soccer shoes might work well as well. That was a good idea, too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and every everyone's feet's different. And see, that's, that's the thing, is uh, footwork is super important. Um, where you're practicing your sword, that's definitely a big factor. Um but if you trash your feet, you're not going to be doing this for very long. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people stroll into class wearing big boots. And I mean, if that's what you got, okay, I'm glad you're in class. But that I would not recommend that because you got to be light enough on your feet to be able to put them in the right place. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Coolio. Um, all right. So, uh, we did have two questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to say the last question here. Um, I was going to ask the question, um, what's the difference between fighting people, you know, versus fighting a complete stranger. Let's do that another time. Um, so this last question is, uh, the difference between, uh, Olympic fighting versus like HEMA fighting tournament style versus self-defense fighting with blades hmm it's well it comes down open. it comes down to self-defense in the end doesn't it uh one your goal is to stay alive the other your goal is to hit the other person first is it not yeah mm-hmm. i mean the difference i like i'm trying to think of a clever answer for this but yeah, I mean, you you hit it pretty much on the head. I mean, I, I think it just builds from there. You know, you see like the flying lunges in Olympics, which you would never do in a martial context, uh, just because of how open they leave you. Yeah, right. Because if you hit them first, you win. You get the point. Um, but so, there's no recovery after that. Right. And I mean, in HEMA, you would never, uh, I say quotes, air quotes you would never as i do it all the time um you know make those sort of kamikaze attacks because especially in a tournament setting you're gonna um you're gonna get docked points for it or you're gonna double um i'd say i'd say one difference to consider though between say a tournament and a pure martial situation is in a tournament you're expected to fight and then you'll have another fight later in the day. And then you'll have another fight later in the day. And that's going to be on your mind. You're probably going to be looking to conserve some energy between each of those. Whereas in a pure martial context, you need to blow what you've got to get through the fight in front of you. Yeah. And I would say, yep. too, in a, in a pure martial sense, like, it, it, if you can, the, the best case scenario is you run away. Like, you don't. You know what I mean? Like, um, like, Can you like imagine a, having to face down someone and they got a sharp sword and you got a sharp sword. Oh, it would, it would be, it would be horrifying. I would, my pants. At that point, I, you hope it's not a suicidal fighter. Exactly. I mean, that in and of itself, like the, the sound, just the idea of, um, you know, being hit with a sharp weapon is, ugh, it, it sends shivers down my spine. I would not. Would not in a million years want to do it. I've cut myself with a chef's knife by mistake, and I do not want to think about what it would look like with a bigger blade. 
Yeah. And oh yeah. I I hesitate to say this because I don't want it to sound like hyperbole, and I don't have any experience in this. But honestly, I'd rather get shot through with a nine millimeter than get run through with a sword. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Any. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, like. Obviously, no matter what, it would be non it would be non fatal. But some of the, um, I don't know. Would you rather stand toe to toe to somebody with a gun and they have a gun, or would you would you rather try to fight it out? You know, that's pretty scary. Like if you're thinking, I mean, if you're if you're like nose to nose with a dude and he's got a and he's going to shoot you, and you've got a gun, and so you have to defend yourself. I think that that prospect is equally scary, but um, I guess what I meant was like a single nine millimeter. If I got shot and like it passed through, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as long as it doesn't hit my heart or my spine or your lungs or my, my well, even if I get hit in the lungs, I will go to the hospital. If, if I go to the hospital quick enough, they're going to save my life. Right. I mean, if you're in a like a situation fighting to like a knife against a knife, you there have been people who have survived multiple stab wounds i mean you know it's it's well right, doable. with a knife though it's like you know a big knife the blade is like this yeah i'd like, probably go for the the sword on sword fight because typically most people aren't going to have the the biomechanics or understanding of what it's like to fight with a sword they don't close like derek the terrible yeah, they won't. They won't close in like me. They won't see the passing <laughs> step coming. No. Okay. That. Yeah. There's the difference in Hema, and not in Olympic fencing because I would get murdered. Um, but in Hema, I make passing steps and I try to close lines because I like to grapple because I'm a big guy. In real life, I would never do that. I would fight like the most spacious skippy back what you're saying you'd put those long arms to use yeah hand snipes you name it like you don't do all day <laughs> yeah it, it would be it'd be hand snipe until the sword comes out of the hand and then i, I mean and i'm assuming in this it's scenario, fight over at that point yeah there's there's no way for me to get away from it so yeah i mean yeah on one on one side i think the fear right the fear because i mean we're civilized men on this podcast. Um, you know, we, we, we try and do right um, day to day. But being forced into a situation like that, and, and, and I have, let's say I have my saber, and it's like the sharp version. And this other dude's got a sword, and it's about the same. After the initial shock and the fear, and we're doing this, once that sets in, I think I'd feel at least comforted that I that I practice a lot and I'd feel pretty confident and hopefully that would translate because I would just murder the dude who tried to kill me with the sword. Oh, right. <laughs> That's well, what yeah. I would feel inside like I'm about to murder you and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to box up the six pieces. I'm going to turn you into a mail them to your mama. You know, it's like <laughs> that's what I would be feeling. Oh, yeah. I mean, at any point, like um, in any sort of true self-defense situation, a lot of the times people say it, it is you. It's you or the other guy, right? So it's it's obviously got to be the other guy. So no hard feelings, but um, to to more piece apart the other bits of it. So like Olympic fencing and um, HEMA, Olympic obviously has a lot of rules, and you play for points. And it, a lot of the times they'll make these suicidal attempts at getting shots of their opponent because if they hit first, they get the point, and uh, so they're all the better for it. Whereas if you're fighting in HEMA, um, I'm basically just explaining the difference at this point. Which and that's fine. I mean that after blow. A lot of people like to use that after blow as like a punishment for you being, for you getting them. Yeah, I would definitely say that I I appreciate the after blow a lot in HEMA because it really starts to make you think differently about the way that um, I mean fighting works in general. Even so, looking at uh, manuscripts because I feel like. Um, who is it? Myers. Myers, it feels very sport-like in his approach to longsword as opposed to like Lichtenhauer um, where it's more of like a 
you know, an understanding that this is a self-defense art and that what you are doing is trying to minimize your damage while maximizing the damage of the opponent. Where Myers will have these incredible, you know, faint sequences and moving around. And you, I wouldn't, you know, you'd never do that in a real fight, I would think, because it's just impractical and scary. I don't know. I, I think in a real fight, a faint would be pretty effective. Well, potentially effective. Well, it comes down to, again, the disposition of the other person. How inclined are they to their own survival and lack of injury? Yeah, if they're high, forget it. Don't faint. <laughs> <laughs> so, I get... Is that is that kind of what, what, what you're saying, Derek? Like, nothing fancy. Yeah, like I mean, like if you're in a if you're in a fight for your life, I would not try to do like a uh, like a Duplierin or a Blend How or, um, what is it? A, a Schlüssel, you know, the key, you know, like anything weird. It's very, you know, mm-hmm. very ox, very plow, um, patience, things like that. Um, but then again, that's just a preference for differences between manuscripts and. Um, long swords masters and stuff like that i find lichtenhauer to be very practical and powerful honestly yeah um i think meyer and i haven't studied meyer much but i've looked at it some and i've done some stuff and it's pretty cool and it's pretty fun i do get the sense that a lot of it is because of its time and place like in in those times it was illegal to actually thrust on somebody and if if they got injured or died because you thrusted them you get the death penalty i mean it's pretty serious and so when they (laughs) practice you know their their art form it's like okay well it gets pretty boring when you just do the basic stuff and so you know when you when you got a time and place where maybe you got some wealthier merchants and they're all sort of getting together and they're all practicing this thing sort of like I don't want to say it's fake because it's not fakey, but they're they're embellishing and doing some elaborate things because they're practicing more. And not to say that it doesn't work, it's just it gets a it's like a flashier way of accomplishing something. Right. I don't know if I'm off base. Someone who does Meyer is totally gonna to be upset at that. <laughs> um but anyway, that's just kind of how I see it. Yeah. Typically somebody who I think I mean anytime I've met somebody who is a is a big Myers fan they're usually a high level longsword fighter in the first place. So they can kind of pull off those intricate like sure. feints and other sorts of drills. But in my eyes, what I see is somebody who's really distilled and sported the, the discipline rather than somebody who's just using it for general day self-defense. Well, and part of it might come down to, I've heard a, I've heard the saying, you know, uh, if you do any martial arts for a year, you will be able to handle somebody who has done no martial arts. But anything beyond that first year of it, uh, you're at that point pretty much only training to fight someone else who has also been doing that martial mm-hmm. art for a similar amount of time. You're getting into the, you know, third, fifth level deep uh, play and counterplay options that you wouldn't see it necessarily in a uh, self defense context. Right, and sometimes that can be to a detriment um, to the more experienced person, right? Somebody who might not understand that something that they do is going to be uh, dangerous, you know? They might throw out a cut that's otherwise really unguarded and, lack of a better term, stupid, but for somebody who knows that it's stupid and doesn't realize that they don't know that, you know, yeah. They won't see it coming, yeah. Yeah, they won't see it coming because the guy shouldn't have done it in the first place. Ultimately, you're sparring or fighting um, against the man, not the system, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to say Lichtenhauer is this, Meyer is that, I mean, sure, we can say those things, and and I have been. (laughs) Um, But it it really does boil down to the context of the individual that you're you're crossing swords with, I think. Um, Because sometimes if you're just so good at the bread and butter, it doesn't matter that, that um, your opponent can pull off, you know, some of these, these, uh, these uh, Meyer techniques. Um, I mean, ultimately there's the strong, the weak, 
and your footwork and, and where you're at, right, spatially with the four openings, and that's it. So if, if, you, if you can leverage that simply and powerfully against someone who's trying to do something else to kind of to kind of sort of come around that um if you are better at the at the 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 bread and butter and be powerful i i think at least you stand the same chance as someone who you know knows all these other other kind of go around techniques with the with mm -hmm. the that's fair I'm not saying Myers trash. I think it's really cool, and I think the discipline is definitely worthwhile. Um, <laughs> no, call call it out. My, I'm gonna say it now. Myers trash. It's trash. I mean, oh geez. It's no, trash. I I don't think it is trash. <laughs> I think it's cool. It's yeah. I, I mostly would almost say that as I'd hope that somebody you know somewhere out in the ether there's that Meyer professional who sees this and is like. <sighs> I'm gonna show you, Derek. Derek like, Shorty, yeah, yeah, I hope dead. so. <laughs> you're dead, me, brother. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, that would be really cool. I'd love to see somebody who has a high level understanding of um, of the Myers manuscripts. Um, just you know, fight. Not even me. Fight somebody. Yeah. Well, um, at Indus, they've got some some really good um, long sworder dudes, and you know, a lot of that is Meyer. And um, yeah, they're they're good. So it, it'd be cool. Um, they do a thing every once in a while where it's like uh, open invite. We should go. I went the, the one time, but we should go. I think it'd be super fun. Yeah, yeah. it's not a bad idea. Yeah. So uh, you could kind of see what they, you know, what some of these guys do. Um, yeah, it's they'll get you <laughs> if you're not <laughs> careful. It's cool. And when cool. I went, I was so dog tired i kind of i was disappointed in my performance but it is what it is i want some redemption <laughs> <laughs> um yeah um okay so let's let's circle back to uh, olympic fencing really quick um I, i'm gonna support why olympic fencing is is cool um but then i'm gonna dog on it a little bit um some things that olympic fencing really gets right is uh the weapons the weapons and why i say that is it doesn't matter if you're a little kid if you're a diminutive woman if you're a big man you could all pick up that sword and you can in a hurry start practicing and you focus only on the technique because it's weighted to such that you don't your arm does get tired but it doesn't get tired from the weight of the sword it gets tired just because you're waving your hand around and you're not used to that um, and even to this day, like I have some Olympic weapons and when I want to work on my speed and just pure technique, I'll pick that up and I'll go and I'll go and I'll go and I'll go. And that they've just picked the right weight to the to the weapon. Right. Um, and it the, the pedagogy. Right. Is this unbroken line from military saber to today. Um, they have some really amazing coaches out there um it's super dynamic they have you know they they get to try their stuff in the olympics all that all of that is good um but now i'm gonna trash it uh yeah someone who's really good could come in and like small sword style let's say they're defending themselves with a a small sword basically and they can sort of do their their disengage voodoo and come in and wah, and and stab you where they want to stab you. If it's against someone with an axe or a, or or a, a baseball bat with like a knob on it or whatever, some kind of mace, you're dead. Yeah, you're done. Sure, you're but done. Sure, but they is... are going to double you. Right, but that was also never the intent of the system's development, right? Right is is there yes. a is there a battle ready <laughs> Olympic S stock? No, no. Yeah, so no. I mean, you're thinking of at this point you have to rewind yourself if you're going to start doing mixed weaponry like that. You have to rewind yourself to Row Earth, who does have a section on how to fight a musket, how to fight a small sword, how to fight mm -hmm. against a right. spadroon. I think but the I, closest battle ready thing that a that a um, an Olympic fencer would recognize is a spadroon really what about a rapier 
Uh, Spadroon's just like a smaller rapier. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm thinking right. of something else. Well, rapiers are so long. Um, okay, you know what? I, I'll I'll say that. I'll say rapier too, like a, a rapier or a spadroon. Um, I think they, especially like epee fighters, they'll really understand the rapier pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. I, I won't. I'm never gonna trash talk epee or rapier fighters because I I'm, I'm trash at that weapon. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, I I won't trash it either. But um, just that. In and of itself, the way that you practice, um, a lot of Olympic fencers they'll they'll pick up HEMA weapons and they're super good. Sure, and I mean that's there's a lot of transferability on just the general sense of distance, timing, how your body moves, what closing a line actually means. Yeah, because they've done all that. Right, could and, be related to athleticism too. Yeah, and over time, they're the better HEMAists than like the sure. major sample. Yeah. So what you're saying, Nate, is we should all sign up for Olympic fencing. No, you should just do <laughs> military saber at Bladefoot Academy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> good plug. How about that for a plug, eh? Easy. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, well, what I'm saying is because I don't want to do Olympic saber or Olympic um, style fencing. Like I don't want to do that because there's too many rules. And it's hella expensive, and it's like a parallel set of gear that I don't want to get into. Um, I would rather just sort of learn the techniques um, and sort of steal the pedagogy that, that they've got online and integrate that into our HEMA class, which um, I think you guys have noticed I've, I've sort of done that this year. Mm -hmm. And I think it's working good. Um, obviously going to and i've had conversations and stuff like a, a, a buddy of mine from my old work um you know he did olympic fencing and you know we would talk and he would kind of show me some stuff and you know i, I met his his coach and you know his coach so, showed me some some cool things and um no that stuck with me they're really truly amazing athletes and like i said they are the unbroken line of swordsmanship of the european tradition but they've sportified it so much that they're like a third of the of the answer, right? Of the of the sword riddle. They're the footwork oh, answer. I, yeah. Yeah. But even then their footwork is like super aggressive that uh, even on the street I don't think would work. You have to tone it down a little. Like you can't do Olympic style, like I'm gonna win my tournament. They have to dial back their footwork to a more martial footwork to to win a fight, a real Re fight. Really, you think so? Yeah. Oh yeah, no. It's like I was saying earlier, like all the all the flying lunges it was where so they're far. yeah, where their shoulders are so far ahead of both of their feet. I mean, that's 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 how you die. That's how you face plant. Because they're counting on their opponent to step back super thick, super quick. Oh yeah, on the line. Yeah. Yeah. When the their opponent's not going to do that because they're, they don't – most people have no idea the, the – like even if they have a hand weapon, they just don't understand like, like swords people understand managing distance. They just mm -hmm. don't get it. They'll plant and they'll just be tough and they'll swing that thing, right? So if you're an Olympic-style fencer and you're going to do like your stuff to get in there, you don't need to do that. If you do, you're going to be like – kissing their nose but on the other hand i don't think anyone who does olympic fencing is ever making the argument that it would work in the street so no exactly um, they they wouldn't do it. it or would be caught dead fighting in the third dimension <laughs> yeah that's the thing traverse are like what happened <laughs> <laughs> okay not really but yeah yeah olympic slander <laughs> <laughs> totally i'm calling you out no i'm not yeah, Draco. I don't know if you guys have, have uh, fought Draco. Um, he's pretty good. He still does Olympic fencing. Um, hmm. Heard a lot about him. Yeah, he's he's really good. He showed me some things. He is lightning fast. And then so like I have uh, you know Epe's him. I'm like, hey dude, let's do this. He looks at me. He's like, no, no, I'm not gonna fight that with you. It's it's no fun. Oh, <laughs> oof. Because he beats me all the time with it. But you know it's it helps me. I get better every time yeah. I fight him. So he, he, he just does some 
yeah, some really cool voodoo. He's like out on the on the outside, and then you cross, and he'll just do this disengage, whoop, and like every time. So I started doing that. And it Back around bothers people. Interesting. We'll have to break out the Olympic uh, sabers. Yeah, we uh, we could do that. It's it's cool. The thing is, though, they're not very kinetic at all. You just can't follow through. Mm. Vines are trash with Olympic swords. Yeah. Well, I mean, like thrust work and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. That's definitely where they shine. I mean, that's what they're for. <laughs> cool. Hey guys, uh, really quick, what projects are you working on that you want to share with the world? Oh gosh. Um... About nothing really right now uh you know plug blade fit academy and in, in in vancouver washington get more people into the club so we can fight more guys and totally we want more guys guys gals nine binary pals whoever wants totally. to fight Just i'm down show for it up, man we're all the same like you gear up you want to suit up and fight you're in we all wear black gear hema black. no that's a lie uh, except for Eric. Eric is white. <laughs> That's a lie. He's pretentious. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why it's the double breasted jacket as well. Yeah. The <laughs> officer's jacket looks pretty slick. And it, it's it stayed does. relatively white. You don't have that gross off white armpit thing going. I am <laughs> fighting tooth and nail to keep it that way. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how long it holds up. Yeah. Our bones are all white and red when you go deeper into the bones yeah we all bleed red buddy we all bleed red but yeah no nothing i want to plug cool eric what do you got uh nothing formalized yet i've been kicking about with the idea of trying to create a comprehensive approach to weapons fighting by pulling from as many historic masters as i can and then using a modern perspective to try and close the gaps or fix any contradictions but that's a that's a very long-term ah. thing i've only just barely started that mm. hema string theory huh yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> yeah good, good luck with that yeah yeah we'll see how it goes well for me i'm, I'm working on a ton of stuff all sword related um because i'm crazy like that this podcast for one thank you guys um for anyone who's listening who's still with us thank you very much um, we're going to have lots of podcasts. So it's my goal to interview a new person each week um, and to keep the, the pods uh, coming on a regular basis. And guys, this was super fun. Um, I don't yeah, know I how. It. Yeah. Um, I don't know how often you guys want to hop on and do this and be like, uh, you know, um, either guest hosts or just someone to kind of, you know, we could ping pong or whatever. But um this was super fun. You guys are definitely invited to do that. Maybe not every time, but from time to time. Or maybe every time. And maybe we just don't link up. I don't know. We'll talk about that off off of the pod. Um, yeah, podcast, uh, Blade Fit Academy. You know, we do youth classes. We do adult classes. I'm working on a tournament in July um, for youth. We do um, uh, Sports Sword. It's like a soft kit. Um, it's like... Um, the soft boohert training and the rule sets are very similar to that um i got certified by um well as modern sword fighting and unfortunately just because of geopolitics that is that dream has sort of died but the art form hasn't um it's like h and b soft now kind of um so the the rules are different all my russian friends that i had I'm not sure when I'm ever going to see them again, and I'm not sure how friendly I should be to some of them. Um, and it's it it's kind of sucks, but um, yeah. But I learned from those guys, and uh, so we're sort of changing that um, for a, a slightly different rule set, but still kind of the same thing. So I call it Sports Sword now. Um, it was called Sports Sword before, then it was Modern Sword Fighting, and now we're calling it Sports Sword again. So the aim is to get different youth teams going in sort of in a regional area so we can have a tournament circuit. So ultimately, I want to do that. Um, and with the adult classes, guys, um, I wanted to do more tournaments for adults as well. Um, I wanted to start inviting in other clubs. And we did something really interesting 
uh, this last class, we introduced poker chips as fight tokens. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, tell me about that. What was that experience like for you guys? Uh, I lost four tokens. <laughs> Uh, because I was, I wanted to fight as much as physically possible, and I I blew myself out by the end of it when everybody started throwing tokens up. But it was a lot of fun. I mean, it's um, I don't know, just another another measure of you know being able to see your progress or how well you're doing. I think it was a very good idea for getting people to fight defensively because they realized that oh, every hit against me is another step towards losing my tokens true it was it was a good way to force people to fight to keep themselves alive first and then hitting the other person second <laughs> yeah i i agree with that um it definitely upped the tempo of the fights and everyone fought everyone else mm -hmm. i really liked that that was cool that was a great experience sure you don't want to just keep losing your tokens to the same person yeah right and I got to say, um, one of our newer students, um, he's not new to martial arts, but Jeff, that dude's a sleeper fighter, man. Mm -hmm. He crushed almost everybody. He's the tall one, right? Yeah, and he's, he's quiet. Right, he's yes. tall, and he's yeah. kind of big, and he's like, yeah, I'll stick fight you in my T-shirt. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's what he did to me. He's like, oh, I'll stick fight you in your T-shirt, and I'm like, I don't know, dude. I don't... I don't want to like whap you and but he was fine so durable yeah and he's like i don't care <laughs> yeah um i and i really liked it because when tokens were on the line i didn't feel like a jerk when i tried my hardest <laughs> yeah when you tried no it's not that i don't try normally it's that i don't want and uh, you know what okay Maybe, like, as a coach, confiding in people, maybe I should do this, maybe I shouldn't do this. But uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand where the line is. Like, totally crushing somebody who is new or who um, is just, like, in, I don't say this in a conceited way, someone who's just not at your same experience level. Like, I have this thing inside, like, what does it serve me to crush somebody who's at a particular um, place in their journey. Like, yeah. what do I get out of that versus what does the person in class get out of that? And, mm. and I run the academy so that everyone else can feel good and have progress and, um, you know, come away feeling positive and like they've learned something. And so anyway, when, when the chips are down, I get to put all that away and I just get a fight. Sure. So that's what I liked about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I've definitely, I mean, I'm not an instructor, obviously, but I've, I've done the same sometimes just in our free sparring where if I notice something works on someone, I stop being creative and I'll just throw the same thing until they learn the lesson of how to stop it. <laughs> Usually by counter cutting into me and, you know, getting a victory for themselves at that point. Right. Getting, getting them to learn in some way. That mm. was, um, like, uh, Nate said, when the chips came out at the beginning, um, some people who might not be as experienced as I was were, you know, asking me to fight and, uh, I would, I would start off pretty light, but, uh, if they started to get a lead on, I'd be like, okay, so now, now I get to turn it on <laughs> and I'm going to start making more of a dangerous play. Right. And that's when people learn that I like to grapple. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. This was really fun, man. I appreciate this. Yeah. It was great being on. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I guess that's it. Maybe we should just wrap this up. All right. Sounds good. Sounds like a good point. Yeah, I should probably got to take my meds and go to bed. Oh, yeah, it is getting I said oh, an hour and it's like been two. Shoes <laughs> Shoes are the most important piece of kit. Sleep is the most important piece of uh, learning. <laughs> yeah, don't overtrain. That's a huge no-no. Oh, totally. We should talk about that later because I've done that. I think we've all done that. Oh, yeah, just blow yourself out and mm -hmm. feel terrible. Cool. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I'll wrap it up there then. And... 
Yeah. All right. Well, I got a I got a close up thing here. So everybody, thank you again for listening to the Blade Fit Today podcast. Uh, I'm your host Nate McBride, and we've got we've got Eric and Derek on. And uh, have a wonderful evening, and I'll catch you on the flip side.